Hi, this is Peter Tsukahira. And in this session, we're going to speak about why is Israel important to the kingdom of God? Now, when God wanted a nation that would be his example for all the other nations, he didn't recycle an existing one, but he created a nation out of one man. Out of Abraham, he created a nation. And many years later, when he brought that nation to freedom through the Red Sea, out of captivity in Egypt, he met them in the desert in, a, in their dysfunctional state. And he spoke to them these words that are recorded in Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These were the words that God spoke to the children of Israel in the desert. You will be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. This meant that God became king of Israel and Israel became his example of the kingdom of God. Being a kingdom of priests meant that no one is in God's kingdom by accident. Everyone is, has a chosen role and a specific purpose in God's kingdom. Being a holy nation means that from the start, God's vision of his kingdom was always an entire society in which each person in his kingdom has a specific role. Some of the people in God's kingdom are called to a religious function, but only some. When God ruled Israel as king, he only chose one of the 12 tribes for a specifically religious role. The other 11 tribes were chosen to fulfill all the other roles that were needed in society, and God provided them with the gifts and the abilities and the resources to fulfill those roles. God's kingdom was always an entire society. What happened to Israel after they became God's kingdom there in the desert? Well, they wandered in the desert for a generation, and then following the leadership of Joshua, they went into the land that God had promised them. They conquered that land, they settled, and they began to live for the first time as a more or less normal nation. Now they had a law and a government, and now they had a land in which to live. They began to plant, they began to harvest, they began to prosper, and incredibly, according to the Bible, they became weary of having God as king. Yes, the people of Israel became tired of being the kingdom of God. According to the Bible, they looked at the other nations around them, and they were jealous of the other nations because they had human kings with palaces and fine honor guards. It says that the people of Israel went to the prophet Samuel, who was spiritually leading the nation at that time, and they complained to Samuel. And they said, we're not happy with this set up with God as king, having an invisible king. We want a human king so that we can be like the nations around us. Samuel argued with the people. He tried to convince them that this was not a good plan. But in the end, he was pressured by the people and he prayed to God. And here in 1 Samuel chapter 8, we have an account of that conversation which took place. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 6 and 7. But the thing was displeasing in the sight of Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people in regard to all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. And so in the days of Samuel, the people of Israel rejected the kingdom of God. And in place of God as king, they received human kings. Now there are at least six books in the Bible that deal with the history of the kings of Israel, but I think I can sum it up for you in just a few words. Human kings were a disaster for Israel. Of all the human kings that they had until the time of Jesus, only one of them was really a great king. All the others were in some way compromised or outright failures. The first king of Israel, the first human king, that is, Saul, was a failure because he refused to obey God fully. The second king, 
of Israel, King David, was a wonderful king. What made him a great king was that in his heart, David always wanted to be the little king so that God could be the great king. The Bible says he was a man after God's heart. But after David, his son Solomon, although he took the kingdom of Israel to its heights in terms of prosperity and wealth and influence, later in his life, his heart departed from the Lord. And because of his many wives, he went into idolatry and began to worship foreign gods. As a result of this, after him, the kingdom was ripped apart. Ten tribes in the north and two tribes in the south and civil war between them. According to the Bible, the ten northern tribes never had one good king. It was one evil king after another. It was idolatry, it was corruption, it was political intrigue and assassination. And finally, the northern kingdom became so weakened that it was overcome by its enemies, conquered by the Assyrians, taken into captivity, and the people of the northern kingdom disappeared from history even until today. The two southern tribes of Judah and Benjamin lasted longer, a few hundred years longer, probably because they had reformers. Kings like Hezekiah, Josiah, rose up at certain points. They tried to bring the southern kingdom back to the rulership of God. But in the end, the southern kingdom too fell into idolatry and political corruption. They weakened to the extent where they were conquered by their enemies, the Babylonians, and taken into captivity. And so for 70 years, the nation that had been chosen to be God's kingdom on earth ceased to operate. Here is something that is recorded by the prophet Ezekiel, who prophesied during the captivity in Babylon. Please read with me from Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 33. Here's what God spoke through this great prophet during the Babylonian captivity. As I live, declares the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand and with outstretched arm and with wrath poured out, I shall be king over you. You see, God's desire to have his kingdom, to bring his kingdom to that place of peace and prosperity was still alive in his heart. You can, you can hear the anguish in the heart of God through the words of his prophet. After 70 years of captivity in Babylon, a small remnant of the Jewish people returned under men like Nehemiah and Ezra. According to the Bible, this was in no way a triumphant return. Only a fraction of a fraction of the people came back. And they tried their best to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and to rebuild the temple that had fallen into disrepair. But according to the Bible, the elderly people among them who remembered the glory of the former house wept in disappointment. And the people of Israel, even after they came back from the captivity, they were never truly free again. They were under the Persians and then under the Greeks and finally under the Romans. This meant that pagan, non-believing rulers ruled the people who had been the kingdom of God. And Israel that had once been God's kingdom became a, a small, unimportant, vassal state under the rule of pagan foreigners. Surely during those days, the people of Israel who recalled the former glory and, and God's words to them in the Bible, surely they must have cried out in despair and, and in repentance, asking God to forgive the, the errors, the sins, the mistakes of their fathers when they rejected the kingdom of God and took instead human kings. Surely they asked God to return and visit them again. But there was no voice from God. There was no prophetic visitation. And centuries passed. In fact, we know from history Almost 400 years passed in between the Old Testament and the New Testament. But then, according to the prophet Isaiah, the people who were in darkness, they began to see a great light. And a man arose in the Galilee, a man with power from God. Such power people had not 
heard about in their lifetime. This man could speak a word and the blind would receive their sight. He could stretch out his hand and the lame would begin to walk. He could multiply food for the masses. He could walk on the surface of the water. Thousands followed him. Then it was tens of thousands. They came from all over the northern region and even from areas that today we called Syria and Lebanon. And he had more than miracles. He had a message for the nation. He was speaking out to the people of Israel. What was he saying? He was saying, listen, Israel, repent, turn around, change your ways. The kingdom of God is here. Of course, the people of Israel believed that this was not a new message for them. They believed that this man, with his power, he would bring God back as a ruler of their entire nation. He would restore their society. He would bring back what had been promised them in the scriptures. They wanted to make Jesus king. What if you had five minutes alone with God, and during those five minutes, you were allowed to ask him one question? It would have to be an extremely important question, don't you agree? Well, the reason I mention this is because the disciples of Jesus had five minutes alone with him. The last five minutes they spent with him here on earth before he ascended into heaven. And during those minutes, they asked him one question. This was the most important question that was on their hearts, the most, the most vital thing they could ask him. It's recorded in Acts chapter 1, verse 6. It says, when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? These were not ignorant fishermen. These men had been his personal students for more than three years. They had witnessed all of his teachings, all of his miracles. They had seen him die on the cross. They were personal witnesses of his resurrection. They were fully New Testament believers, and this is what they wanted to know. Will you bring your kingdom back to our nation now? Let's take a look at his answer for just a minute. Verse 7 and 8. He said to them, It's not for you to know the times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the uttermost parts of the earth. He told them that they would receive power from the Holy Spirit to be witnesses of this kingdom. He didn't tell them no, but he didn't tell them when the kingdom would be restored to Israel. I think because if he told them it would take 2,000 years, they probably would have been very depressed. But today, we're seeing the kingdom of God beginning to be restored even here in the land of Israel. Let's summarize for just a minute. Israel was chosen by God to be an example of his kingdom. He, he established Israel as the kingdom of God, as a holy nation and a kingdom of priests. Israel rejected the kingdom of God during the days of Samuel, and instead, Israel received human kings. Human kings were a disaster for Israel and led Israel into captivity. During the Babylonian captivity for 70 years, God's kingdom ceased to operate. And after that, when the people came back, they were no longer free. But then after several centuries, Jesus rose up in the Galilee, preaching, teaching, and demonstrating the kingdom of God. And he sent his disciples out to all the world with power from the Holy Spirit to be witnesses of this good news that God's kingdom has come again to this earth. And we ourselves are witnesses of these things, that the kingdom of God now is being restored after all of these years to the nation and the people of Israel. This is why Israel is so important to us in our understanding of the kingdom of God today.